I think that you have to allow women to negotiate their own way among these you know, competing pressures. And it's not for outsiders to tell them how they ought to do that. What people from outside can do is offer support when they need it. For example, if they're locked in the kind of family relationship where, where fathers or brothers or whatever are being unacceptably dictatorial, then we need to make sure there's shelters for them to go to, for any woman to go to, that we need to make sure that, well, that immigration laws, for example, are such that they don't feel that leaving their relationship will you know, um, mean that they won't be able to stay in the country. There's all these other little support mechanisms. But, I mean, people working on domestic violence, for example, learn pretty fast that you can't make a woman leave a violent relationship until she's ready to go. And um, that's, this is kind of an extrapolation of that, that really you can't make a woman be, um, you can't force liberation on people. But I do accept, as I said, that, that, that yeah, that the choice is a, is, a, is a difficult word to be wielding when there's so many competing pressures. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to invite questions from the audience. Yes, I'll, I'll just. So we, we might need a microphone here. Thank you. Um, my name is Dakane, and um, I guess I'd like to offer my opinion from an intensely personal point of view. Um, obviously, a Muslim woman. Um, my family background is um, of Afghan origin, um, but I've lived in Australia my whole life. Um, but really, I think I want to offer my point of view just as a member of society, because I think there are some fundamental um, human rights at stake here if we do go with the pro-banning, the burqa um, stance. Um, Virginia, you make the sweeping statement that um, in Western countries, women are free. And I think that that's blatantly flawed because if it were true, there would be no need for feminist movements. Um, it's true that Australia highly values a uh, woman's choice, um, but don't you see the irony in taking away that choice to empower her? And I also feel like you mentioned that Australia is a liberal, liberal democracy, but it's almost as though there's a disclaimer there. It's a liberal democracy only if we're told, only if we behave exactly as we're expected by the mainstream. Um, and I can tell you now that any woman who is forced not to wear a burqa, has that freedom of choice taken away from her, will not tear the burqa off and shout out her liberation to the world, but rather she'd retreat further into her home, preferring, to leave, preferring not to leave the home than to leave her burqa and her beliefs behind, as rightly or wrongly as her beliefs and convictions seem to us. Um, so I think that it comes down to the fact that it's not so much the burqa that is un-Australian, as you say, but rather your call for a ban that is un-Australian. Thank you, Dakani. I, um, look, I think you make some good points, and certainly you're right. I mean, we talk about freedom of women in Australia and freedom of women in the West, and goodness gracious, I'm the first to say it's not true, is it? But we strive for it, and unfortunately, yes, we still do need active feminist movements because of that. Look, it, it, as I said, it, a ban is not something I feel comfortable with, and the, the, ch the issue of choice is a very vexed issue. Goodness gracious, I've written a whole boy book on choice. It's a very difficult issue when it comes to women and their choice. I guess it comes back to, um, I do believe that, oh, and as Shakira has, has quite rightly pointed out, we are talking about a very small minority, of course. Um, I mean, I've only seen uh, one uh, woman recently in Canberra wearing the full niqab, um, certainly more in Sydney, but only one here. So we're talking about a minority, but it's that minority that I'm targeting to say, what is this burqa, a uh, niqab, what is this about? Why is this woman covering in this way? Now, as she walks with her husband, my understanding of that is because her husband does not want her to be seen in public, all right? Why is that? What is that culture of mistrust about? 
That's what I'm targeting. Why is that woman reduced to her sex and that being unacceptable to be on display in Australia? That's what I'm targeting. Okay, but this, this is a, I'll repeat what Dukhani said is it's condescending and patronising to assume that this woman is uh, being compelled and this is not her choice. That's a very fair, fair point. And you know what? I think that yes, there is a cut-off point at which I say to some women, you are wrong. You are contributing, you are complicit in your own subjugation. Women do make bad choices. We all make bad choices. As I said, some women choose to arrange a marriage for their 10-year-old daughter to a 21-year-old man. The woman who did that lives in Australia, Rabia Hutchinson. Later on, she says, oh, I, I underestimated the negative effect it would have on my daughter. Some people do make wrong choices, and for that small group of women who are in that group, some of them, I believe, probably feel compelled. Now, it's interesting, you know, Shakira says we, allow, we need to allow women to negotiate their own way. How can a woman who comes from a very strong background, where within her small community, she's in, she is required to fully cover, fully wear a niqab or burqa, how could she go to her husband or father and say, you know what, I'm negotiating my own way, I'm not wearing this anymore. We know, we know that within those very small communities, women don't have that power of negotiation. They do not have that power of voice. That's why I'm saying, yes, as a feminist, I come across the top there and I say to all those men who are running those communities, you know what, we do not accept that behaviour here. It's not good enough. First of all, it is a bit of an innovation the way that it's being worn in Australia because, as I said, it, you're wearing it a lot more of the time. These issues about wearing it in schools, they don't arise in Muslim countries because, I mean, of course we have single-sex schools here, but there still tend to be males walking around, you know, still tend to be male members of staff. And so there have been, as, as Hillary mentioned, cases of, you know, girls and teaching assistants too, wanting to wear it. And responding to that by saying, oh, there's heaps of teachers wear it in Saudi Arabia, I think is not quite to the point because they're not wearing it while they're teaching and I accept that. Um, I think that if you are wearing it and then you are accepting these limitations of employment and, you know, and participation and the thing is, when we start to have conversations about banning it, then Muslim women, I haven't spoken to any, whether they wear hijab or not, any women who aren't really uncomfortable with face veiling in Australia and who wouldn't be arguing just as hard as me with, with their daughters, their sisters, their cousins, whoever, if they wanted to start wearing it. But when we start talking about bans, then we feel that we have to defend their entitlement to do so. If we don't defend the decision, but we do defend the entitlement, and it's a distraction. It sort of pushes us into ways of talking, pushes us into ways of saying, well, well there's a positive side to gender segregation, which I mean, there is. Everyone wants to get away from men now and again. Like, you know, come on. You know, it's it can be. But that women's space can be very nurturing and very warm. And, you know, and it's not my natural position in life to be defending face failing and defending gender segregation, that's not my usual position, but when it comes under this kind of attack and when Muslims also start to feel that once again it's an issue that's particular to them and so they're being singled out again, then we have to have this, we have to adopt a way of speaking that, that isn't our normal way of holding conversations.